successful business is a formula. Once you've got the products, the reference accounts, a working business model, the right people, and exponential growth, then you should go out and raise money. Welcome to Entrepreneurship 101 and our bootstrapping lecture our, uh, and our money module, which is probably one of the most important modules of the entire course. Who here is, will have to or is already bootstrapping their business? Does anybody not know what bootstrapping means? Okay, good. I actually had to look up bootstrapping um, during business school, so I didn't know what it mean, meant at one time. Um, I am. I would like to also extend a welcome, welcome to the webcast, uh, all the webcast viewers, including the group at Sheridan, Sheridan College and the Innovation Factory in Hamilton. Thanks for joining us. It's always great to have you with us. Um, tonight we have a great speaker um, who is a serial entrepreneur, and he's interesting because he's he's sort of he's been sort of like with nine lives. He's done a, a number of different things. Uh, Charles Plant is the founder and chairman of Material Minds. He founded this management training company because he had run into one too many managers who were overworked, overwhelmed, and armed with little management training. In his uh, career that has spanned over 30 years, he's coached over 1,000 managers. Uh, he spent four years at Mars during a really key area of our development where he helped build, um, where he led a group of former entrepreneurs and specialists who provided education, mentorship, market intelligence, and capital to over 2,000 technology startups. A number of the services that we have at Mars, Charles was integral to building out, including market intelligence and the online resources in the Entrepreneur's Toolkit. Speaking of which, if you're looking for funding, one of his ideas was to make a funding sources directory, which has uh, about 500 resources in the funding sources directory can be found in the Entrepreneur's Toolkit on our website. Um, but before that, he had another life, another couple lives before that as an investment banker and also as a technology entrepreneur. He spent 15 years as co-founder and CEO of Synamics, a telecommunications software firm that provided mass calling platforms to telcos. And additionally, he taught uh, management accounting at York's uh, Schulich School of Business. What's interesting about Charles is that he has not only been an accountant in the financial area, which you'll see his skills really shine in this area, but it's not his favorite. He actually prefers to talk about uh, management and leadership. So he has been threatening for the last couple years that he doesn't want to be part of Entrepreneurship 101 anymore uh, because he has a new life now and he's teaching management and, uh, and leadership. So I would like your help to keep him and what we'd like to do is have a Twitter campaign that if you don't want him to come back, you, you do hashtag ENT101 and, and at C plant and say he's your favorite accountant, which will rankle him and he'll never come back. But if you do want him to come back, just say that was great, see you again. Um, and we'll, we'll, we're gonna make a special lecture for him next year on just management and leadership because I think it's, it's hard for us to find serial entrepreneurs who really know management and leadership. It's, it's a challenging area. So with that, I'd like to welcome Charles Plant and his presentation on bootstrapping. Thank you very much, Carrie. And I absolutely hate it when people introduce me as an accountant. And if, are there any accountants in the crowd? You know how it is, once you're an accountant, you can never get away from it. You mean, so job comes along and, oh, well, give it to her, she's an accountant. I ended up as CFO of Mars completely by accident because once upon a time I had been an accountant. It, it's a terrible thing. But then I realized coming up that maybe it's actually good because you expect a lot less from someone who's been an accountant, don't you, in public speaking? <laughs> you, you, in public speaking, yes. Yeah, yeah. But in, in public speaking, you expect to be bored to death. So I hope to meet your expectations today, and this will be my last time um, talking about bootstrapping. Um, these companies, it's a good selection of companies. What do they have in common? They're big, they're successful. What else? Global. Individual startups. They were all bootstrapped. Every single one of those companies, in fact, the farther back you go, the more likely it is that a major company was bootstrapped. So it's probably not surprising that Coca-Cola was bootstrapped or Clorox. But HP, a lot of people know the story of the garage and, uh, and how HP was started. Many know the story of Dell and how Dell was started and by Michael Dell in his dorm room as this little project of selling computers to his friends. Uh, Microsoft, everybody knows the story. Not as many people know the story of Apple. Does anybody here 
read the Steve Jobs book? If you haven't, you really should. On, on so many levels, it is an absolutely incredible book. And it's incredible because it's an incredible story about a man. It's an incredible story about the history of the technology business. And it's an incredible story about business strategy. But what surprises most people is how Apple actually got started. And I have to refer to my notes because I have an absolutely horrid memory. Um, 1976 was the time frame. The, a particular chip had just come out on the marketplace, and Wozniak and Jobs thought, you know, we can do something with this chip. So they played around and they built a computer on their own, just fooling around. And Jobs, who was sort of had a, had a business bent that you can see from history, Wozniak really didn't have at all. Jobs went out and said to a local computer store or a local parts store, Would you like to sell my computer? And the guy said, Well, if you can build, 50 computers, I'll buy them. I don't want to just buy your, your little programs, etc. But build me 50 computers, and I'll buy them. So Jobs went and uh, went to the people that supplied the chips and said, I have an order for 50 chips. Will you finance this? So he got supplier financing for the parts. He went and sold them to the company who paid him so he could pay the supplier. It was the ultimate in bootstrapping. And, and you, you hear stories now of startup companies getting five and $10 million. You'll probably be surprised to know that uh, you know, they sold these computers in 1976. Apple actually wasn't incorporated until 1977. And they started with very small amounts of angel money, 175,000 here, 200,000 there, adding up to about a million and a half of angel money. Uh, later in about uh, 1980, they got their first VC money, 2.3 million. I mean, nowadays, starting a company on only 2.3 million would be ridiculous, and they were public after that. So in all, they had less than $5 million of VC money and angel money. And what really was successful for them was the fact that they had customers and repeatable orders before they ever got that money. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, if I get this going in the, in the right way. So you know, I've heard that people tend to know what bootstrapping is. But for those of you who don't, it's the act of pulling a company up by your bootstraps. It is the act of self-financing. It's using your own money and no other equity. And let's put it as equity, not debt, because there are other ways of using debt that are possible within bootstrapping. But you're not giving away any part of the company. And I come, come at this from a, from a background of having done it wrong the first time. And K Kerry mentioned Synamics, which I started in uh, 1986 or something like that. It, is, uh, it was sold in, oh, I can't remember, six years ago or something like that. Still in business uh, under the new owners. But I went to school, and at school, and with most of the advisors you talk to, and most of the people you hear up here, they say, OK, Go start your company, go get your friends and relatives, particularly your relatives, to invest. And when you've got them invested, you then get angel financers to invest. And when you finish that, you go and get um, venture capitalists to invest. So I did that. I went and started Synamics. It, we didn't start with the purpose of building mass calling platforms for telcos, because those didn't exist at the time. But we went out and raised a quarter of a million dollars from friends and relatives, raised some money from angels, raised some money from an early VC, raised some more from angels. And looked around and went, oh, that was a mistake. It was absolutely the wrong thing to do at the wrong time. And I'll go into a little bit about that why as I go through this discussion. This time, I'm starting a company. And it's been two years here now. I've, I left uh, Mars um, April 1st, April 1st, April Fool's Day, two years ago. And uh, have now been building this company with only my own money. So much more entertaining, much different. I've got a much better flavor for this. But I was fully, you know, I subscribed fully to the idea of bootstrapping long before I started this. I was just determined to do that. So why would you want to do this? You know, it's interesting. I didn't know when I started out, you know, all those 26 years ago or something like that, you know, how to do it, what to do. I just had a good education and thought, well, I'll just follow what everybody says. I didn't know many entrepreneurs at the time. It, it wasn't something cool one did. It's just I can't stand working for anybody, and I don't follow instructions very well. So I had to get away. So and that really works as an accountant when you don't follow instructions, let me tell you. Um, 
In time, though, I came to know all sorts of entrepreneurs. And there's something really fundamental that I noticed some point in time, maybe uh, 12, 13 years ago, is all the entrepreneurs that I knew that had started their businesses and hadn't gotten VC funding were doing extremely well. And almost all of the entrepreneurs that I knew, and I say almost, almost all of the entrepreneurs that I knew who had started businesses and gotten venture capital funding were doing badly. And it was a really fundamental difference. And I can point to you tons of people who are successful entrepreneurs who've had venture capital money, but they really haven't had built the wealth that the people who started it and bootstrapped did with their own businesses. And that's the first thing that, that, that said to me, okay, there must be a reason for this. Why do the people who don't get outside financing do better than the, uh, than the people who do get outside financing? So I started this crazy thing of, of researching. And I spent tons of, uh, tons of time researching what it takes to be successful. I'm continuing that nowadays. I just wrote a research paper you can find I put on the web today, that, or yesterday or something like that, that, is, that deals with employee engagement as one factor in the success of businesses. So this is a chart, and you can actually find, if you go on the Mars website and, and search out phantasma, phantasmagorical forecasts, under my name, you can find this. And what you tend to see when you are, uh, are advising companies is they come into you with these absolutely amazing forecasts. And I met a company like this two weeks ago. They've been out trying to raise money for 12 to 18 months, are having great difficulty, and someone said they really should look at their forecasts. And so they called me and said, you know, come and look at the forecasts. So, so I looked at the forecasts. They were... Um, forecasting revenue of $43 million in six years and profits in that year of $32 million with an investment of $1.2 million. If anyone would like to invest in it, um, you can just give me the money instead and you'll do just as well. Um, what this is, is a great piece of research. Not, I don't claim ownership of this one, but I found it. That is the trajectory or the graphs of revenue for each year for the top 100 software companies ever created. And what's really interesting about this is that it shows how long it takes to grow the best companies. And the average here is something like 10 years to get to 50 million. In the US, it takes about six years on average for the best companies to get to um, 10 million. Six years to 10, 10 years to 50, and that's the best of the best companies. Now, that's pretty rare, as you quite imagine, as you can imagine. Last year in Canada, there were about 100,000 businesses started up. Of those 100,000 businesses, about 51% will last five years. People have heard these stats. It's not a bad rate. So if you're, if you're starting out and you can beat five years in a business, you're getting more than, your, um, more than 50%. Of those 100,000 businesses, about 2,000 or so look for funding in a given year. So, Kerry asked the question, how many people are bootstrapping? How many people intend to look for angel or venture capital money to build their business? We've got around 20 people or so in the audience who are, who are figuring to look at venture capital funding. So you're actually probably about 2% or 1% of the whole market of those who will go and look for venture capital funding. A lot of people think they will, but they end up not doing it. But 1,850 look for funding. Of those, um, 400 a year get funding from venture capitalists, and about 90 a year get it from angel groups, not angels separate from groups. So of the 1,850, we're only getting about 500 companies that are getting VC and angel money. And when you look at 500 companies, that's one half of 1% of the total companies started. We spend a lot of time talking about venture capital and how to raise venture capital, but in actual fact, only one half of 1% end up getting venture capital money. Now, the big problem isn't that. It's the fact that of those 1,850 who go looking for money, and of the 500 who get money, only 30 end up getting money back. Absolutely abysmal result. Okay? Only 30 exits out of 500 companies on an annual basis. You can look at the results for the past couple of years. Last year, the result was one company went public, 
and 29 companies were sold in mergers and acquisitions. It's a terrible number, isn't it? When, when you can think, let, let's look at that, let's, that's VC-backed companies. So 400 VC-backed companies and 30 exits. We're talking about 6% or so of the companies actually managed to exit. You've heard the rule of how VCs make money. You know, you invest in 10 companies, um, two do extremely well, two do okay, and six do terribly. Well, that's not what's actually happening. And that's one of the biggest problems that exists nowadays is that um, VCs are investing and only about 6% of the companies they invest in ever go public or go through an M&A. In Canada, and I don't know the stats from the last two years, but in Canada, the average VC loses money. The average return in the Canadian venture capital industry is negative. Now, there were some old VCs around that for years managed to do well, but finally, in the end, weren't able to. Companies like Ventures West. Companies like Vengrowth, which was a labor-sponsored fund, did extremely well for the owners of the fund. But, the, sorry, for the managers of the fund, not for the owners. The problem is that VC, the VC model is predicated on doing extremely well with very few, and in Canada, there aren't enough of them doing that very well. If you look at the US statistics as well, only about 15% of the VCs make money. And those 15% make so much money that it makes up for all the rest. So when you look at the average results, they're making their great 20, 25% returns as an industry, where in Canada it's negative. But in fact, we're just like the other 85% of the VCs out there, not doing well. But you might think, okay, what does that have to do with me? Well, what it has to do with you is if you get VC money, what do you think the likely outcome is? It's going to be negative. You're not going to get money back for your company. And this is why when I looked around, all of my friends who had not taken VC money were doing extremely well, and all of the ones who had taken VC money weren't doing well. Is that the whole process and the way it works, and the way it works particularly in Canada, does not work. It's a broken process. So if you want to get yourself into a broken process, I, there's somebody up here in the front saying why. I have a thousand opinions on why, but we don't, can't go into a thousand opinions on why yet. I've done that, that research too. But if you want to get venture capital money, the likely result is that you won't make money on the transaction. And if you want to talk to somebody about that who's been through it personally, other than myself, Cynthia Go who is the founder of Entrepreneurship 101, has been in that position a number of times. Built great companies, she's not getting any money out of them, even though they're successful. So, if you go on, then you say, before we go, Research in Motion, BlackBerry Now, good example of a company that didn't get venture capital money, started in, what's your guess? When were they started? 1984. It was some 12 years before they actually found out what they should do and became successful. 12 years of wandering in the wilderness, which you can do when you're not backed by venture capital money. You can wander in the wilderness, figure out what your game plan is, make little bits of money in various ways until you've got a formula that works. And that's the key to bootstrapping. Okay? We're going to figure out how to make a formula that works. So. Before you start, the first thing you have to do is line up credit ahead of time. Now, you, you might think that you know, it should be no problem once you get going. But if you're starting a business, the banker is going to look at your best income. So if you're stepping out of something where you're earning good money about to start a business, take out as much credit as you can. Get your credit cards. Put the available limit up as high as you can. Get as many lines of credit for as much money as you can. Don't use them yet, but chances are you might need them. It'll be scary. It'll be a horrendous thing to try and do, but you actually might need it. And if you don't line up the credit ahead of time, you can't do it later. So it becomes your cushion. You might think, I only need 25000 to do this. And if you have, in fact, if you look at Inc., they do a report every year on companies started less than $10,000 or $5,000. Yeah, that's great. But 
you know, if you've got an extra 20 in line of credit sitting around, you can make a few mistakes and have a little bigger cushion than having to actually call it in when you've only got $10,000 to spend. The second thing is find somebody for, to be a mentor. Now, um, when I started Cynamics, I actually used as a mentor an individual who died last year. His name was Bob Fershat. And Bob Fershat was the uh, CEO of Northern Telecom, as it was called at the time, Nortel. You'd think going in the telecom business was a good idea. He gave me one of the best, worst pieces of advice ever, which was you know, learn to build a business in your own backyard before you go out into the street. And which meant what worked for Nortel was building a business in Canada successfully before they went in the US. So that wasn't particularly good advice, but I still liked the fact that I had somebody to bounce things off of, somebody with experience. Now, when you're going to find a mentor, do not use your mother as a mentor. <laughs> For some reason, mothers always tell you that you're doing a great job and keep doing it and keep encouraging you. Find somebody who's a bit ornery. Find somebody who's going to tell you the nasty things that you need to hear. And don't find somebody with a general big business education because they can't relate effectively to the needs of an entrepreneur. Find somebody who's been there and done it in your industry. Very particular, those things. Been there and done it, started a company in your industry. Chances are they'll know what works and what doesn't work in the industry from the start. They'll be able to get you in touch with the right people at the very beginning because that's something you'll need. And you'll save yourself a lot of time and aggravation. Don't use your lawyer, don't use your mother, an uncle who happens to be a banker or anything like that, but find some good mentors. Next thing is pick the right business. Now, you know, it might be easy to say, but you, you've got dreams of going into these enormous businesses. But if you think about it, if you want to start up a, a wind farm or uh, want to cover 20 square kilometers of Nevada with a solar array, it's not probably a very good business to bootstrap. There are businesses that are capital intensive, and those are absolutely impossible to bootstrap. So if you're looking at a business, look for one that first is not capital intensive. The second thing is when you're looking for a business to bootstrap, find one where you get your money up front in the beginning instead of one where the money comes out over a long period of time. So if you're selling a SaaS-based service, that's all very nice. It builds great value, but it's going to be very costly in the beginning to start that business because it's going to be a long time before it's paying for itself. That's why many software companies, you know, years ago, started up just selling product, selling your whole software license. Now, mix your business so you're selling your software license and maybe some things add up so that eventually you've got a, a, a flow of revenue on an annual basis. But if you start in a capital intensive business or um, you know, working capital intensive business, either of those two types, you'll end up you know, bashing your head against a wall if you're trying to bring, um, bootstrap. Next thing, okay, so you've decided you're gonna do it. You decided it's time and you're gonna get going. First thing you have to do is find the pain. And this is a, a fascinating exercise. When I started Material Minds, I thought I was going to address a certain type of pain. And following my own advice, I went out to try and find the pain. And in order to do that, I talked to over 100 people. And it's probably the best thing you can ever do. Don't try and sell them something. Just ask them questions about what hurts. If you're doing that, you're engaging in a conversation. You don't have to tell them what you're doing. You can tell them you're looking for opportunities. You're evaluating a number of value propositions. You're doing something like that. But you're going to find out what people on the street really think. There was a, anybody watched today's TED Talk? Anybody got lucky enough? Dana Reilly. Absolutely tremendous TED Talk. It applies directly to this. It's why people love their own ideas and other people think they suck. And, and he goes into research directly about that. And I immediately thought of all the entrepreneurs out there who think they have the best idea in the world and all of the VCs who think their idea sucks. Well, chances are, until you've talked to 100 people or so, your idea does suck. I found that as I went out there, the more people I talked to, the more I realized that I'd gotten the pain wrong. And the problem I was trying to solve was not a problem that anybody really cared to solve. It just didn't matter to them. 
that's something very fundamental, that, that finding that early on is going to save you a hell of a lot of time. When you have too much money, what you can frequently do is immediately go and start developing product and find out when you go to the marketplace, which is a traditional Canadian approach, that you're not solving the right type of problem. In which case, you've got to go revector, or what do they call revectoring now? They've got some pivot. Oh, I just I love the way they invent words. I, I should be I should be cooler and use words would like pivot. Yes, I know revectors. I'm out of the 80s, uh, 70s. So. That gives you a chance to do it on your own dime without wasting somebody else's money. Second thing is, people will tell you, and you'll hear a lot of people say, you know, write a big business plan. Well, that is complete and utter nonsense. I think my business plan was written this time around on a whiteboard. Last time I did it at Cynamics, I wrote a full business plan, 50 pages, blah, 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 charts, graphs, forecasts, all this crap, completely wrong. And it was wrong within months. It wasn't even years, it was months. And this is the problem you get. If you're out there talking to people and finding the pain, until you actually go through that process, you might as well not bother writing anything down except maybe on a little, little yellow sticky note about what you think the answer might be. Don't spend too much time on this because, and, un and unfortunately, everybody tells you you have to have a business plan. You don't really need a business plan until you figure out what business you're in. And that's what talking to all the people are, and even then, you probably don't need the plan until you know you have a replicatable business. And we'll get into what a replicatable business is. Now, if you've left your place of employee, you're going to be starving to death unless you do something. So what I did immediately was I went and got a few consulting gigs. And you'd be surprised how, how easy that is when you've got something to add. And you don't have to go get major ones that take you five days a week and don't let you any time to develop your business. But it's nice to have a little bit of money coming in the door. Does anybody here have a spouse? <laughs> it's very nice to have money coming in the door when you have a spouse. Because if you don't, then the spouse gets very worried and you have somebody uh, wondering. What, I'm getting good reactions up here in, in the front from spousal support. <laughs> Consulting revenue, do a day or two a week. Enough to keep the lights on, the doors open, and, and do enough work, giving you enough time to go and talk to people and find the pain and go through this early process that you need to go through um, to support yourself. Next thing you do is as you're going through this process of finding the pain and consulting, start building a product. Start building at something. And in all likelihood, it will be the wrong thing in the long run, but it's actually something that you're going to show people when you're talking to them to prove that you're serious. So whatever it is, if it's, if it's software, if it's digital media, clean tech, whatever it is, build something. It could be a prototype, just something as a talking point. So you've gone through the process. You've got some consulting revenue. You've talked to 100 people. You, you now have some sort of prototype. And now you're actually starting to get into the market with something. Now, this process actually took me a year and a half. I only came out of the process of figuring out early product, early value proposition, something like uh, December timeframe. So you'd be surprised how long it takes, which is why it's so valuable to go and earn that consulting revenue so you just don't have to worry all the time. If you're bootstrapped, you can make that as slow as you want, as long as you can support yourself. You can take a really slow, calm, logical approach to building a business instead of having an investor nagging at you all the time. Where's the revenue? Where's the revenue? Because they will ask continually because you've told them there's this great opportunity. So you've now got to the point where you can ramp up. The first thing you want to do when ramping up is to leverage relationships. And you're going to be leveraging relationships the whole way along, particularly as you're finding the pain, trying to talk with hundreds of different people. But at this point in time, you want to leverage relationships into customers, into people who you've identified through your research is your target market. Now, Microsoft is a great example of a leveraged relationship that made a company. Um, you know, Gates and Allen really didn't have much in the very beginning. They had a basic compiler, was all they had. And uh, Gates's mother was served on the board, on a volunteer board, with someone from IBM. And 
she happened to be talking about what Bill Gates was doing, and the person at IBM happened to mention that they were bringing out this new thing called a personal computer, and they needed an operating system. You know, at that time, Microsoft did not have an operating system. They'd never made one. They built basic compilers. They built things like that. So Bill, being a rather smart individual, went out and for $50,000 acquired an operating system. Bought it lock, stock, and barrel, no royalties, uh, and it was called DOS, Disk Operating System. He renamed it MS-DOS and provided it to uh, IBM as the operating system for the first PC that IBM brought out. That was the foundation of Microsoft. That simple conversation of Gates's mother with someone that she served on the board with created arguably one of the most successful technology companies of all time, whether you like their software or not. That's the power that you'll get and the accidents that will happen in, in relationships um, that are just unbelievable when you get to it. Second thing you want to do is find the fox. Now, when I first put this picture up, I, I wanted to find a picture of a fox. And I, I, I'm not much on modern, um, so I Googled fox. And I got this picture and I thought, yeah, she looks like a fox. <laughs> And so the first time I gave this talk, I put this up, and I, you know, I was criticized for using Megan Fox in, in this, not knowing that this, her name was Megan Fox. So it's actually a good reminder of finding the fox. What you have to do when you're out there trying to find customers is find the one, cus the one person in the company that you're trying to target who is the fox. And that fox is someone who's going who's gonna to champion your cause who's going to make it so that they take you under their wing and do all they can to make you successful. Many years ago at Synamics, we were uh, working predominantly with large call centers across Canada, and we, were, we were, had the opportunity to work at Bell Mobility inside the network, which is eventually what we uh, revectored. What's that word again? Pivoted, thank you. We eventually pivoted the, the business into. And we met in um, person, uh, an irascible character, hope he's not listening to this, by the name of Eros Spadato, who you can actually look up uh, on the web to see his history. He's been through a number. He's a clear technology genius, early um, genius in the world of telecom. There was another person that we dealt with at Rogers who were the same, same uh, ilk. And those people drove our business. And the way they drove it was very interesting, very demanding. Um, Early adopt, uh, not an early adopter, an, an innovator, truly an innovator, they demanded more and more out of us. They made us do things that we never thought was possible to do. We created world firsts for Rogers and Bell Mobility, things that no one else in the world had done before because someone took the time to work with us and realized our capabilities. That is the fox, and that's the person you need to be successful. What you don't want is to have what you're talking about delegated to a junior level manager. Junior level managers typically aren't foxes. What you don't want is a committee because committees typically don't make those types of decisions. You need the, the maverick, the radical, the person who's playing around in the business and trying to do interesting innovative things to build the business for you. Very key. Next thing. When you're talking to the fox, look for service opportunities. You don't have a product yet, do you? We're still talking about developing a product. You might still be living on consulting revenue. You're in now talking to companies, and wherever there is product opportunity, there is probably also service opportunity. And when you think service, you might not be thinking the same thing, but if you're starting a software company, you can build the software on a custom basis as opposed to a prepackaged basis. So the service opportunity is to find somebody who really needs what you do and build it for them on a customized basis if you're in the world of software. I don't know exactly the, the parallels in health technology and clean tech, what things you can do as service revenue, but if you're out trying to build a, a solar farm, maybe you go and consult to other people who have solar farms. And the, and the opportunity is that consulting leads to further involvement with them and a revenue stream from product in the long run, which starts out with a revenue stream from service in the short run. So there's something else that that service relationship gives you, is that it gives you credibility in the marketplace. It gives you to someone to say, yes, this company uh, is a customer of mine. 
particularly good if you get really good companies as customers to start with. And when you're starting out, don't go for the smallest companies. Go for the very biggest ones, because oddly enough, somewhere back there, there'll be somebody who's innovative. Yeah, they're slow to work and they're slow to operate, but quite often, they're the ones you need for credibility's sake. You also have to solve a problem they've got. Now, by solving a problem, what it means is you've got to fit in with their priorities. You might see that something's a problem. You might have figured out that the, there's a certain level of pain. You might find a lot of people who have that pain, but if it's a lower order level of pain, then it really isn't a problem. And this is where this factor of priority comes in. You've got to, make some, you've got to do something that is of high priority for the customer. What we did in Rogers and Bell Mobility was we solved their, pro their ability to uh, compete. We gave them competitive products. In Roger's case, it was the first um, pay-per-view television. They were the first in the world to operate pay-per-view television through the touchtone phone. No one else had done it. They wanted to beat everybody else to the market. In Bell Mobility, it was the ability to do 411 Call Connect. The first 411 Call Connect. Both of those products are completely transparent to you nowadays. You do it all the time. It's completely above board. We built the first in the world for these people because that was a major problem. When they have to do something that's regulatory, it's a major problem. When they have to do something that's strategic, it's a major problem. You won't get anywhere finding a problem that saves people money. Saving money is nice, but it's not a higher order problem until the company's about to go to business, in which case they can't afford it in any way. Go for low hanging fruit. Go for easy things to start with. Find out ways, that major things that people aren't dealing with right now as a way of getting to a problem. So now you've gone through this process, you're actually meeting with customers, et cetera, you've got to land a sale. First thing is you now have to land a sale with the product that you've developed bit by bit over time. To land the sale, one of the key ingredients is credibility. Now if you go in, and this is some of the problem when you get venture capital money, is you're going to use the angel or venture capital money, you build your product, and then you go in to make a sale, you've got a product but you know, it doesn't have the credibility because you don't have relationships with customers. You don't have service relationships with customers. You haven't been going out trying to find different opportunities to ingratiate yourself with customers, and so you don't have the credibility. The f objective of the service opportunity is the first level of cre credibility. The objective of the first product sale is the second level of credibility. And so in that regard, do not care what your profit is. Don't even care what your revenue is from the first product. Only care about getting a reference, because you're going to use that reference to get the next sale for more money, and then to get the next sale for a profit. So at this stage, all you are doing is, getting, is buying references by providing products. You've got to meet, at this time, competitors head on. And there's some great, great stories around. It seems that whenever there's a really radically new something that comes out, there are three or four people in the world working on it at any one point in time. And so you think that you have nothing, you're sitting below the radar, and all of a sudden you pop up above the radar, and at the same time, three or four other people pop up above the radar. You've got to meet them as competitors, but you also have to meet this entrenched competition. The entrenched competition is the old way of doing things. You've got to figure out how you're going to get from the old, away from the old way of doing things. And this again, the other secret is don't worry about revenue. You've still got your consulting gigs, perhaps. You still have your service revenue. You're using this product sale as a way of getting a customer and beating the competition to be able to say you've beat the competition. Now, as you're going, as you're flowing, as it's developing, you can start concentrating on getting revenue. Only at this point in time should you actually start worrying about the metric of revenue. When you've got VCs and angels in there, they're going to be worried about revenue the first month. You're going to have told them, because you've probably done wacky forecasts or phantasmagorical forecasts, you're going to tell them you're going to get to $5 million next year. And unfortunately, for some reason, they believe you. So they're going to expect the $5 million. And then they're going to say, OK, where's my $5 million? And you're going to say, well, we're not there yet. We're still trying to blah, 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 blah. So, you know, they're not going to get $5 million. They're going to be after you all the time. Then you're going to do the wrong things to get some revenue. But in this nice, logical, orderly fashion, you haven't worried about money, and you're building revenue. 
While you're doing that, keep your overhead low. Um, I'm working out of a, a lovely south-facing den in my place. And the great thing about that is that on nice days, the sun streams in, and it's all very quiet. I don't have to spend half an hour going to an office. I, you know, I don't, I don't really care. I don't like people. I told you I was an accountant, so. <laughs> I don't fundamentally like being with people, so it's really great. It's an enjoyable place to be. It keeps my overhead very low. I don't have any full-time employees. What I do is, as I need help, I contract people. And there have been four or five that I've contracted with over the last year to do various things for me. I keep it small and I keep it local, and that way I can control the costs. The problem is, if you get people on board, you've just dragged your overhead up. And the key is to that, keeping your costs variable. Keep your costs flexible so that if you get someone, you just get them by the hour as you need them, not full time. It's a great temptation to get people full time, um, to, to bring them in because you, know, you want somebody to knock ideas off of, but they don't have the same motivation as you do. They don't have the same uh, fervor and drive, and even if they do, you, know, you are now spending your money, good money on them, when you might be better off renting them. Low fixed costs and uh, keeping costs variable is a secret to being able to bootstrap longer. If you can, find employees who will share the risk. Now, I was really lucky in starting Cynamics that my co-founder was a person who had been at IBM in sales. And so it was a perfect marriage of two individuals who worked together for a long time, usually quite well. Um, but if you can find people who share the risk, it gives you two things. It gives you the idea that, number one, you're on the right you know, you're on the right track, somebody's willing to share the risk with you, and you'll also get something done for nothing. Now, I've been trying to find people to share the risk with in Material Minds, but unfortunately, people know all about me now. So the, I'm, I'm finding it a little harder to find somebody to share the risk. Eventually, I'll do it. Otherwise, I'll have to earn enough money to hire people. You want to leverage suppliers. Just as Jobs did, if you're out there and you're selling something, get the money from selling it before you have to pay the people. That's the business model of, uh, what are these great box club, Sam's Club and places like that? Their whole business money model is built on turning inventory very fast, selling it to you and collecting cash before they have to pay their suppliers. They sit with money in the bank and earn a return on the money in the bank, which is how they earn a lot of their profit and how they're able to keep prices so low. So if you can do that, you've got a really great system of leveraging suppliers. And as you're going through this process, working with customers, doing custom things, bit by bit, if you can do it, you've got the customers to pay for the product development. And that's what we did very, very well at Cynamics, is that we sold things to the customer on a customized basis that we knew we needed in the product in the long run. So that we had four or five customers who, year after year, were paying us money to develop our product. Secret to bootstrapping in that regard is getting your customers to pay for your product development instead of getting a VC to pay for your product development. As you're doing this, you've got to figure out your business model. And your business model, you had something on business model, right? A successful business is a formula. And it's a formula of being able to say, I know that if I make 100 cold calls to this target market, that I will get uh, 20 responses five visits and one sale. Once you know that, you really have your business model down pat. Now we talk about other things when you talk about business model, but to me it's a lot about the, the method you're going to use to make money. And what you need is predictability. You need to know at this stage that if you do X, Y will result. Then you've got a formula for success because all you have to do is more of X and you'll get more of Y. And you do it again and again and again. And you go through this process until you have it all right. Until you know that, yes, finally, you've got a product. You, you might still have services revenue, but you've got a product. You know you can sell it. You know your target market buys it. You know how often they will buy and how many you have to call in order to buy it. Think about back to Jobs again when he bootstrapped. He knew that he had people who wanted to buy computers. He knew without a doubt that if he made a certain number of calls, he could get a certain number of sales and a certain number of people would buy his computers. And he did that long before he got any venture capital money. Michael Dell knew the same thing. 
Gates knew the same thing. He had, they had orders and replicatable revenue time and time again before they went for venture capital money. And then what? Once you've got the products, the reference accounts, a working business model, the right people, and exponential growth, then you should go out and raise money. That's when you need it. Because you're going to need that money to take the X and do 100 times X in order to do 100 times Y. But if you get the money before that and use it to figure out your product, your reference accounts, the business model, the right people, and the exponential growth, you're going to waste all that money. You're going to have to do it again. You'll have had a down round. You'll be washed out. And you'll be left running a company in which you have a very small percentage, which is what happens a lot to companies who raise the money too early. So if you are going to raise money, you then have a choice at this point in time. Because at this point in time, you can either choose to do it yourself and not grow the company quickly, or you can choose to raise money and do it very fast, which is exactly the position RIM was in when they went out and raised capital. Are there any questions? And that's uh, Twitter and my blog. You, we could just get the uh, questions. Just go to the mic so the people on the webcast are able to hear you. Thanks. Sorry. Could you recover the, um, the leverage supplier section one more time? So, yeah. no problem. That's an easy question. Thank you. Um, at least I know the answer. The, the, if you want to, what you want to do with suppliers is you, you want to get them to accept credit terms. So pay them in 60 days when you're selling to your customer and they're paying you in 30. Got it? You mentioned uh, taking on people that will share the risk. And the magic, or the, the, the question there is, how, how much do you give them? And how do you figure out how much you should give them? And you also mentioned having a partner. So when you're establishing a company with a partner, how do you decide what percentage of the company each of you gets? Well, that's a good question. And there's no easy answer. I like the first question. Can you repeat the first question again, please? I can answer that one. Yeah, the first question no, was No, no, you, no, I'm kidding. Oh, him. Sorry. Um, <laughs> That, that is a really complex question. It's, it's a whole variety of factors. And you know, how do you do it? Are you co-CEOs, or is one the CEO and one isn't the CEO? Because if you're co-CEOs and you start at the same time with both amount the same amount to offer, you get equal amounts. But one's the CEO and the other's not the CEO, but you start at the same time and have equal offer, then one gets 60 and one gets 40. And you can start going down from there based upon length of time, amount contributed, and role played. And, and that's the only way I can suggest it. You know, you don't want a situation in which someone feels uh, taken advantage of, and you don't want to be taken advantage of. So it's a, there's an emotional reaction to it that you have to build into this. It can't all be built in logic. But whatever you do, make sure that you have the ability to get the person out. Because if, if the person comes in on a certain basis, let's say, OK, he's going to take 30% of the company, and disappears two months later, and you've still got they still have 30%, then you've got a big problem because you're left, um, they own 30% and you're still doing all the work. So you... Just as a follow-up to that, how can you do that in advance? How can you do that in advance? How much each person That's a good question and uh, there's no, no, answer. no answer. This is where it comes down to a gut feeling. I know this talk is about uh, bootstrapping and we're all against VCs, but... Uh, Boo, yeah, boobies. <laughs> but um, what are your thoughts on, uh, say, government grants? Oh, they're great. Okay. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Just, uh, just, just, just want to know if there's any suck as stories. much up of government grants as you can get. In, in, and I should have mentioned that, but I, I, I tend... I haven't bothered going for any government grants because I find them... You know, they're very particular. You have to be, uh, you know, five foot six and uh, with a background in uh, computer architecture to get this grant, and so I get tired of them. One of the best government games going nowadays is actually disguised as a venture capitalist, and it's called the Investment Accelerator Fund. And it's really just a government grant because the way they take their terms and conditions are so great that it's better than any angel and better any, than any uh, equity money you'll ever get. So any money like that is perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Investment Accelerator Fund. You can find it at Mars. You can phone Barry Jakir or Shirley Speakman 
or Michelle McBain tomorrow and say, I want some of that government money. So Barry will be here um, in a couple of weeks doing one of our lectures about, uh, with a couple of panel of VCs, so you can ask him about it then. He'll present it to you. Hi. Uh, can I please get your thoughts on crowdfunding? Oh, another great source. Absolute great source. Uh, Amanda Palmer did a really great job in crowdfunding, blew the market off what she expected. All sorts of people have done that. It, it, what works best is the pre-sale of something. So if you appeal to a consumer audience, you're, it's not equity funding, it's not angel funding, it really, it is pre-sales. And if you think of crowdfunding as pre-sales, unless you're running a charity, then it's a, it's a great way to, to do something. Can and I in use? fact, what is really good is if you can test the market for a product by selling something that you don't actually have. If you read the four hour work, four hour work week, four hour work day, four hour work week, Tim Ferriss, decided to try selling shirts online just to see what the results would be. And uh, you know, he got so many orders and said, OK, that's going to work. This is how, then I'll go and make the shirts. Uh, Seth Godin did it and said, oh, if I get eight orders, I'll make the product. Well, he didn't get eight orders. He got seven or something like that. And so he didn't make the product. And then that Monday later, he got a few more orders. But he gave the money back to everybody. So crowdfunding, advanced sales, it's great. Other than hard work, long hours, what's the secret to selling consulting services? Persistence. Persistence, the seven times principle. You have to touch somebody seven times before they'll even think of buying from you, okay? Literally, it's an ongoing process, it's a dance. First time you, you talk to them, they don't wanna listen. It takes persistence and going back and back and back and back until you get it right, until they sort of warm up to you. Two points and a question. One. Old school is in, so re-vector all you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Second of all, since Megan Fox starred in a movie called Transformers, <laughs> and the Fox is to help transform the company, keep Megan Fox in your Oh, that's good. Screen. You see, I, I wouldn't have known anything she was in. <laughs> the question I've got is, uh, Mars just was part of the Lean Startup Conference a while back. And they had, is it Mark Andreessen, the uh, fellow who started Netscape? Yeah. He was coming on as the big VC, VC uh, venture capitalism was going to change radically. And whatever became of that? Because you're just telling, you've just told us that they're lucky if they get maybe 6% of successful stuff. Well, that's Canadian numbers. Okay. And that's not Mark Andreessen's fund. That's the other 85% of funds that do terribly. Okay. He is in a very special position uh, of, and it's a special position partially because of who he is and partially because of who the, that group has funded. The 15% that come out of a few areas in Boston and, and Silicon Valley are ones that have so many relationships and know so much about very little, very well-defined areas that they're immediately able to see where it fits and how it fits and how well it will do. And unfortunately, in Canada, one of the factors is that you can't become a specialist in Canada in funding anything. So you can't know any particular market well enough to be able to know that, you know, you just know the general factors of whether something's going to work or not. And I guess the other part to that, if you were to look at what you just gave us, is there something in 2013, especially in Canada in terms of bootstrapping, that other than uh, crowdfunding or investment accelerate funds that you found oh, this is something new to add to the bootstrappers' arsenal, of helping them become a successful company? Well, the whole world of marketing. You know, I, I've been going through this. I've been learning so much over the last two years. It's absolutely astounding. And you, know, you, you worked in the 70s, as I did, right? I, I'm telling tales. I hate, I, I hate to admit it. And if you remember the 70s, there wasn't voicemail. There wasn't a fax machine. You left the office at 5 o'clock on a Friday night, and you came back at 9 o'clock on a Monday morning, and it was exactly as you left it. It was exactly the same. <laughs> nothing had changed. There were no messages. There was nothing. But on the other hand, you had no ability to find or reach people. You, you had to go to the library to look up what companies existed in a financial post-index card file or in, in these massive books. 
you, you would buy lists, but the, f how to identify who the customers were. There weren't Gartner and Forrester and everything like that to tell you what a market was like. You had to go and talk to thousands of people. When you went to market, the only thing you could do was send a letter or make a phone call. There was no Twitter. You couldn't establish relationships. There was no social media. There were no faxes. There was just absolutely nothing. So the world today, the biggest changes have occurred in marketing. All the rest, you know, it's pretty much the same as it always was. I mean, we've got crowdfunding, but crowdfunding is just a, a, a marketplace for pre-selling, okay, more than anything else. So, you know, in terms of the way the world has, has changed, phenomenal and unbelievable the things I've had to learn. And the capabilities. I can sit down at my computer and put up a piece of market research, pay, you know, less than $1,000, and in 24 hours, I'll have responses from 500 people. The, I played in market research 30 years ago. That is ast astronomical to be able to do that. So take advantage of all of those things that you can. Listen carefully to the marketing um, of these things. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> <laughs>